Hello and welcome into my latest live video. My name is Carrie Holzman and thank you for joining me today. Today is, uh, what's today? Wednesday, the 5th of December, 2018. 20 more days till the fat man. All right. <laughs> Wait, what? What'd you call me? So uh, today I'm gonna show you how I install and configure Windows 10 for the PCs that I build for clients. It's a pretty straightforward and simple installation. And it starts with a USB flash drive. Now this USB flash drive I've labeled it as Windows 10. As I make this video, the current version of Windows 10 is 1809. And um, you know, despite what you hear on the internet, it's fine. Don't listen to people. There are lots of different ways to make a Windows 10 bootable media. Uh, I have a video demonstrating one way. If you know of another way, good for you. For everybody else, you can follow my video. And I'm gonna start with the flash drive that I created in that video, and the link to that video is in the notes below this video that'll take you to the other video if you wanna see how to create one of these for yourself. Downloading and installing Windows 10 is completely free. It's only activating Windows that costs money. And you always wanna make sure you have a legitimate copy of Windows if you care about your identity or you have any respect whatsoever for the people you're helping. Uh, make sure you do it all legit. If you're, what you do on your own is your own consequences, but what you do for others, you can be held accountable for. That being said, I've got old Threadripper here, which has caused me nothing but grief, and I'm going to install Windows 10 on Threadripper. In just a minute, I'm gonna take a quick break, and I'm gonna come right back. All right, I guess that was Murphy's Law, right? Delivery. A delivery came in right when I started the broadcast, and somebody, this isn't what I was expecting, somebody sent me a gift, apparently. Um, I don't know who it's from, but it's a 256 gig Lexart memory card. I always use these in the, uh, in the camcorders when I'm recording, when I'm not doing live, and uh, this is fantastic. This is exactly what I use. In fact, I normally use 128 gig flash drives that will hold about 11 hours, so this should hold over 20 hours of video in HD. So whoever sent this, thank you so much. It, I know it has to be a class 10 card to work to keep up with the speed of the camera, and I had no idea this was coming, and I, again, I don't know who sent it, but whoever sent this to me, uh, thank you very much, thank you. Um, let me just set it over here. And I expect, I'm still expecting two more packages today, so we'll see if we can get through this uninterrupted. In the meantime, let me just take a quick minute before we get started to give a quick shout out to everybody joining me in the chat today. And uh, Orlando Breve just contributed $5. He says, have a Coke on me. Well, thank you, Orlando. I think I will. And I see Greg M., Tim Burchard, uh, Gary McGraw, Grant McDonald, Thomas Carter, Stephen Bernstein, Michael Shaw, um, Mark Baggett, uh, Thomas Carter, Steve M, M Copyright, Rick Williams, Ben DeCure, Paul Eddy, Edward Green, Tony Wallow, Grant McDonald, some of these names I might be saying twice, uh, Jesse Kirk, of course, welcome in Jesse, always good to see Jesse, I think he's one of the first people to comment. 
uh, uh, during today's broadcast. And who have I missed here? Robert Jones, Adam Wood, Bikey Beckers, Russell Franzen, AJ. So hello to all of my friendly uh, wrenches. Those are the people in blue. They're the... <laughs> here we go. Hold on a minute. I'll be right back. You know, there are some days <laughs> I, I can't even, <laughs> just trying to do a broadcast, and that was also not the delivery <laughs> I was expecting. So there's still supposed to be another delivery today. But these were some uh, nylon zip ties I ordered from Amazon. You get them in bags of 1,000 for about $9. So I ordered a couple thousand of these. That'll last a couple weeks, right? But that, <laughs> still not the package I'm waiting for. So I don't know if I should even start this video or I should start over again because I want this to be a, a standalone video. So I'm going to bide my time for a few minutes here and, and say, you know, let's take some questions if you guys have any questions for me because I think I'm going to end up stopping and then restarting this stream so I can have my own standalone video without interruption because I am expecting the UPS driver to be by. So first was DHL. Then it was Amazon's delivery service, on track or whoever that is. And I'm still waiting on UPS. And the one for UPS I have to sign for, and oddly enough, this one from Amazon I had to sign for, which I've never had to do. That was the memory card. I've never signed for an Amazon package before. So thankfully, I was home when that happened. But uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, let's just stall a little bit with some questions. We'll warm up a little bit. And I'll end up stopping the stream and restarting it to film uh, the build the, the the Windows 10 install on Threadripper. Uh, yes, you can donate to support the channel by going to uh, tech-vets.com and hit the donate button. You can also use super chat here in the chat, which will give you a shout out. But on the other hand, I don't have any receipt of your contribution. YouTube takes 30% of your contribution, and YouTube doesn't tell me when they pass your contribution on to me, which could be 30 to 60 days. I can't refund it; it's out of my hands. But with PayPal, if you use the donate button there at tech-bets.com, I get an email that says that you paid. And after the broadcast, because I don't check my email during the broadcast. So after the broadcast, when I have time, I go through my emails and I respond and I say thank you to everybody who's contributed. If you contribute $20 or more, I'm happy to send you a case badge, which is an aluminum badge that says inspired by Carrie Holzman with my autograph. It's aluminum and it's got double-sided sticky tape on it. And I ship those anywhere in the world for free, just you know, for your contribution of $20 or more. And uh, 
if you don't have an email address or a current email address associated with your PayPal account, then I have no way to communicate with you. So if you have contributed in the past and you have not heard from me, it's because I'm unable to reach you. You need to leave a comment in any video and just tell me and then I'll get back to you through the comment section. You might want to leave an email address where I can reach you at. And if you're not a moderator, then your comments are held before they go public. So there's no worry, unless you're a moderator, of any email address or phone number going public because I will never approve that comment. Only I will see it. Because I want you to get a case badge and I want you to at the very least know that I share my uh, gratitude to say thank you for any contribution of any amount. So. Uh, with that, um, again, if you guys have any questions for me, let me just check and see if I've missed any while I've been jabbering on here. See, Carl Taranell has joined us and Velashchev Ivanov. Welcome, guys. AJ is there. Do uh, David Glover. Kerry, is it possible if you could mod my other channel? I don't really use this one. I have no idea what you mean by that, David. I don't mod anybody's channel. I don't have time uh, to really do anything with regards to any channel other than my own. So I'm not quite sure I understand uh, your question. William Dawson says, do you want a Hot Wheels Porsche green race car? Uh, no, no. A real Porsche green race car would be nice, but I probably couldn't even afford the insurance on it. So. Uh, Scotty 1D says, hello, Tony Vento. Thank you for sharing the donation information. Uh, Matthew Barnes, welcome in. Gary McCraw. Tony Wallow says, hey, Carrie, I sent the memory card. Merry Christmas. Ah, Tony, it was you. Thank you, Tony. That was, that was a perfect gift. It really was. It will get used and used a lot. Um, Let's go back. <laughs> Dude can't catch a break. Welcome to my life. That's Ben DeCure. He says, Dude can't catch a break. It cracks me up when people think, you know, what does he do? He just makes some videos. What's so, what's so time consuming about that? And here I, I've been busy all day. I just had a minute to start a video. And then, all right, well, uh, what are you going to do? DJ Matrix says, hello from Moscow, Idaho. Tim Burchard has contributed $5. He says, have a second Coke on me. That's right, I was going to get a Coke, wasn't I? Grant wants to know the easiest way to clone an older SSD to a new one. Age of an SSD has nothing to do with it. Acronis will copy and clone anything to anything. Any storage device to any other storage device. It will literally copy an M2 to another M2 or a hard drive to an SSD or an SSD to another SSD or an SSD to an M2 or an M2 to NVMe or NVMe to flash drive. If it's got enough capacity to hold the data, Acronis clones it. Just search my channel for the word Acronis and there's at least 8 to 12 demonstrations of how Acronis works, live, unedited, step by step. If you want to use some other free utility, then you're on your own, but there's plenty of other YouTube videos. As a working computer tech, I cannot use free tools legally to charge people for that. And Acronis is so easy, uh, it doesn't require much other than clicking next. And I'm pretty sure we can all handle that. And it's cheap, you know, you can pick it up. I've seen it free after rebate, but I usually don't spend more than $30 and I buy it once a year. And uh, again, if you search on my channel for the word Acronis or the word clone, um, you'll find a number of videos that should keep you busy. It's easy, 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 easy with Acronis. Now, if I could just get Acronis to sponsor me, we'd have it made. Um, maybe I need to get that Coke. We have 420 people watching. 420. No, it's 236 Arizona time. Sometimes I get emails from people and they ask me how they can join the chat. The chat room happens automatically if you're watching live. If you don't see the chat, then you're not watching live. There's no option for you to choose. It's there if, it's, if we're live, it's not there if we're not live. How do you join the chat? You have to watch live. After we're live, then the chat continues the playback in a recorded only. It, it just, I wish YouTube would put something on the screen that said live or pre-recorded because it is confusing many other 
more simple viewers, people that aren't very sophisticated with technology, they're, they can't tell the difference. And this is often a problem with engineers. They design things for other engineers, not for regular people. And then regular people can't tell the difference. And who can blame them? I mean, nobody's born with this knowledge. And if they're not going to take the time to accommodate those who don't have it, then they shouldn't be offering the service to those who don't have it. So that's my opinion on that. But most software just sucks. Most software requires the end user to conform to the software. And we've got a long way to go in evolution of software. The engineers, they need management that's non-technical to, to teach these engineers how to design software for regular people. I don't think I've ever seen a piece of software designed for a regular person in my life. So ideally, uh, any software that says, are you sure, that's already broken. Uh, any software, so instead of saying, are you sure, software should have an undo. Every piece of software should have an undo option. It should be the same, whatever the command is, like control Z, it should be implemented throughout the operating system for every single program. As long as you have an undo option, you don't need an are you sure dialogue. These confirmation dialogues are so annoying. People just get trained. You train them like a dog. When they see it, they just, they want to get rid of it. They don't even read it. So they go, delete, are you sure? Yes. They go, oh, oh, that's not what I wanted to delete. This happens all the time. That's why software sucks. When engineers start accommodating normal people and it starts adjusting the software to meet the needs of the end user individually, then we will have evolved. And I'm still waiting for that. I'm still waiting. Ed S has contributed $10. He says, I can't get a Cronus to clone my RAID drive to a new larger single SSD. You have to be using the latest version of a Cronus, and you will probably need to install a Cronus on the RAID array, whatever, you know, assuming you're running Windows on your RAID array, install the Acronis software and do the clone from inside of Windows. That way you're getting the driver. Probably you've got a weird RAID controller that requires a special driver and Acronis isn't seeing it. But if you're using the latest version of Acronis, um, that, that's why it's important to use the latest version so you have all those latest drivers built into the Acronis software. But if you, regardless of that, if you load Acronis into the Windows uh, software it, as a program, then it already has the driver that it needs to accomplish that task. So again, this is software not conforming to the user. It's forcing the user to conform to the software. But this is a very common issue with bizarre, unusual RAID, uh, any type of a controller. RAID is not very often used in consumer uh, applications and therefore there's not a large amount of support by default that Acronis is investing their engineers develop the you know in test uh, all these different drivers but if it is there it'll be in the latest version so if you're not using the latest version get it um, but beyond that uh, you should be able to install Acronis into Windows and run it as a program within Windows and it should work just fine Jack Russell has contributed 99 cents, and Granddad47 has contributed two pounds. He says, good evening from Wrexham, North Wales. Thank you guys for your contributions. And let's make sure, is Granddad a moderator? He, uh, he is now. And I've seen Jack Russell a lot. He should be a moderator if he isn't. He is. And Ed S. will make him a moderator too. Welcome my new folks in blue. Thank you guys so much for your contributions. New live video say live now in a red box. Well, I'm looking at the live video and I don't see that, but I don't know. Maybe more important that it says pre-recorded or something, you know. Oh, I see Shane Schellenberger's joined us. Welcome in, Shane. Apple is designed for the regular person. Uh, yeah, it is, but it's not priced for a regular person. It's priced for wealthy people. Uh, let's see if I'm missing any other questions here.
Matthew says, hello from Atlanta. I love your build videos. Keep it up. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate your, your kind words and support there. Oh, who do we have calling? Could it be a scammer? I feel like this could be a scammer. Let's see. Hello? Oh, hi. Is this Carrie? It is. Hi, Carrie. This is Rachel Walker calling you. I'm the one who emailed you about AARP Magazine. Uh, yes. Uh, can I put you on hold here just a second? Oh, sure. All right. I'll be right with you. So what this is, this is um, a journalist. Her name is Rachel, and she's with AARP Magazine. And she saw my YouTube videos, and she asked if she could call and interview me for an upcoming article uh, designed for, you know, people that have belonged to AARP to take care of their electronic devices. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and answer her questions and take her call right now. And I'm also expecting uh, UPS to be delivering another package. And I hope this will all happen at once so that I can come back and uh, finish this video. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this up just for right now. But I want you to know I will be back in about, oh, 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, we'll move on with installing uh, Windows 10. I apologize for the false start. This just isn't meant to be at this specific time. So rather than try and fight it, <laughs> I'm just going to go along with it. And um, again, I want to thank everybody for your contributions. And if you want to stick around, I'll tell you what. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and let the stream run with the uh, intermission logo. So that way you guys can continue your chat and talk amongst each other. All right? I think that'll be the right thing to do. And then I'll end up restarting the stream after I come back. So uh, for right now, I'm going to go to a long intermission. But you're welcome to stay and chat with other uh, like-minded friends here in the chat room. Thank you, guys, and I'll see you shortly.
Hey guys, hello, welcome back. I apologize for that. We got into a little bit of a, a lengthy discussion. Um, we'll see how they follow up with me on that. But uh, I see a lot of people stuck around. That's fantastic. So thank you guys for sticking around. Did I miss anything exciting? I just got here. What did I miss? <laughs> it's nice for me to do that to you now. See how you like it. <laughs> got my Coke. This is uh, the Coke that uh, Rich brought me the other day. Rich is really liking his new computer. Mmm. Nice and carbonated. All right. So I think what I'm going to do, I think I'm going to go ahead and do the Windows 10 install, and I think I'll just, uh, after the video airs, how do I want to do this? I really should restart the stream, so I could, but I know UPS is still going to show up. That's my problem. They're still not here. I have, I've had no deliveries and no interruptions during that phone call. Murphy is alive and well. <laughs> Murphy's Law. So, uh, I don't know. Do I, do I start over the stream to keep it live? Or do I do it live and then edit it out later? I have a list of things waiting to be edited, and I'm afraid... If I do that, it's going to take forever for me to get around to editing. Stephen Barber has contributed $2 just because you're amazing at what you do. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thanks for your, your support. Shane says, AARP? Yeah, that was uh, Rachel. She's a journalist with AARP, and she was asking about writing an article about maintaining electronic devices. And so I was trying to twist her arm a little bit to talk to her about emphasizing the importance of copying important data, making backups and to talk about uh, the scams of the phone calls that come in, you know, because she wants to know about maintaining cell phones and laptops and tablets. And I'm, I'm saying to her, you know, there's no one sort of blanket that goes over how you maintain an Apple smartphone versus an Android smartphone or how do you make the batteries last longer. You really, there's not a whole lot you can do that's going to make much of a difference. A lot of the stuff is self-maintaining these days. But what we can emphasize is the, the person using the device, understanding that these phone calls that come in um, for claiming they're the IRS, and you guys know. I mean, you're my audience. You know what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, the, the people, the retired people, they're the major victims of these scams. And I, I really was trying to convince her to change the article a little bit. Instead of main, worrying about how to maintain the device, Maintain the person using the device. Nobody cares about your data more than you do. And if you just trust your data to a hard drive, open up a hard drive and see how it works. I don't think you'll trust it anymore. And there's so many reasons why people lose their data. I'd like to see her write an article about the importance of backing up, how to back up, what's the cloud, what does that mean? Uh, what it, does it apply to you? Uh, what about these phone calls? People are using their smartphones to take phone calls, which is draining their life savings or costing them a lot more money than maintaining the smartphone so, you could, so it'll last longer. The amount of money you're saving there pales in comparison to the amount of money that's lost every year in phone scams. So, you know, she kept trying to pull me back to, you know, her questions and I was just trying to make her aware that uh, devices nowadays mostly maintain themselves. Don't fix it if it ain't broke or you could be creating problems for your viewers with the best of intentions. And, you know, I like to use my Volvo analogy, which is just because I bought a Volvo doesn't mean I don't have to learn how to drive because I bought the safest car. No, I don't care how safe your car is. They're not going to, Volvo isn't going to guarantee you're not going to be in a car accident and possibly die or seriously injure yourself you still have responsibility to make the right decisions behind the wheel, or in this case, behind the keyboard or behind the screen. And if, so she's gonna talk to her editor and we'll, we'll go from there. But in the meantime, there wasn't a lot of information I can give her specifically to maintain a device other than use a damp cloth or microfiber cloth to clean a screen because you, you don't wanna use an alcohol-based cleaner because it could wipe the anti-glare off of your laptop or tablet or smartphone screen, could wipe that coating right off of there. But just uh, water with a damp microfiber cloth 
It was great for cleaning television screens, uh, keyboards, electronic devices. I talked to her a little bit about all the germs on a keyboard and a mouse that people may not be aware that's there, that people should know they have dishwasher safe keyboards available that I've demonstrated here on my channel. And, um, you know, a little discussion like that, which again, she was really just looking for maintenance. And it was sort of like, leave it alone. If it's a modern device, leave it alone. That's the best maintenance. That doesn't make for much of an article though, does it? <laughs> Shane says, if she worked it, she would have enough material for some. Oh, I can assure you, the conversation we had just in those few minutes, 45 minutes was it? Half hour? Was enough for many articles, at least half a dozen articles, just on the subjects of backup, on the subjects of uh, scam phone calls. Uh, those two things alone uh, could be a series of articles. And then on top of that, uh, how I talk about you know blowing the dust out of a desktop, but that doesn't apply to a laptop or a tablet or a phone. And then the the idea that is, is there a way to make your battery last longer? You know some of these phones like my S8 from Ga uh, my Samsung Galaxy S8, it's sealed. You can't replace the battery. The manufacturers don't want you to maintain it. The manufacturers want it to die. The manufacturers want you to buy a new one. It's not very ecological at all. These are the times we live in. And of course, these really super thin laptops like Airbooks and things like that, you can't change the batteries on those. Microsoft Surface, it's, it's glued closed. You can't open it. I mean, if you're talented and skilled, you can with a hot melt glue gun and try and heat it up and melt the glue down to get it open. But once you got it open, good luck finding any parts. So that's the problem we run into with maintenance. We really live in a disposable society and the manufacturers are incentivized to continue that to sell you more product. But again, not the information she's looking for. <laughs> but I did the best I could. Garth Clark. Oh, make Garth Clark a moderator? Absolutely, Garth. Here you go. You're a moderator now. Sometimes you just got to get my attention. Windows 10 is the worst and most complex OS I've seen to date. Ben, I respectfully disagree. I think Windows 10 is the most evolved, most useful, fastest, most reliable operating system I've seen in my life. I've never seen anything so simple and so powerful. And when you consider it, it conforms and runs on hundreds of millions of variations of hardware combinations. It's amazing. It's not like Apple, where you only have a couple of hardware configurations to run on. The fact that Microsoft has accomplished this uh, is, is, is not a short-sighted accomplishment. That's amazing how far we've come. That being said, it's far from perfect. But as we make the operating system more powerful and easier to use, we add more lines of code, and it becomes more complex. And it will continue that way. Uh, if we want to emulate a computer, uh, a human brain in a computer, you know, the human brain is far more complex and far more flawed than a Windows operating system. But to each his own. Use what you like. Jeff Stetson says, hello from Mesa. Hey, Jeff, welcome in. All right. <clears throat> I guess I'm going to start this process and I'll just edit it out later. I'm afraid when I edit it out, it's going to be in 720. I got to think about how I can do this. Maybe I can record it locally here on the computer. Let's see. Oh, I'm almost out of hard drive space on this computer. What can I do? What can I do? Where is it saving to? My C drive currently has 6.94 gigs free out of 500 gig. My D drive has 71.6 gigs, so I should be able to save it to the D drive. I'll tell you the reason why my hard drive is so full is the project with Mitch and I, the, the interactive PC build. I've got all the project files there and I don't want to move them because then it, the editing software won't be able to find them and I have to reconfigure everything all over again. So I just want to leave it as it is. So the only quick solution is to replace that 500 gig drive with like a gigabyte, uh, terabyte drive just clone it over with a Cronus and that'll give me some elbow room. 
some headroom to have uh, to work within. Hmm. We have exactly 500 people watching. Jimmy's come in and Jimmy wants to say hello. Say hello, Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. Oh, there he is. Look at his face. Look at his face. Look at those eyes. Oh, skeptical. Crazy dog. Skeptical dog? Hmm. Cobra snake? Doberman? Mutt? Here, do your mutt impression. Ah, he's not cooperating. Smack your butt. I got your face. No, give me your face. All right. Now he's going to take it out on a stuffed animal. You're a good boy. Yes, you're a good boy. You let me know when the UPS man gets here, okay? He's wearing brown, just like you. <laughs> oh, I'm still stuck on how I'm going to do this. Come on, boy. Why don't you do it for me? You want to you wanna get windows installed for me? Will you install windows for me? Oh, scratch right here. Is this a spot? How about right here? Scratch your chest. How about your ear? How about right here? Oh, wait, did I find one? Did I find a spot yet? Right here? Is this a spot? Oh, you're such a good boy. Let's go the other way. Comb it the other way, and then we'll run it back. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're such a tough life. Give me this face. Give me your face. I got it. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. You're going to blow boogers on me? Works every time. <laughs> Uh. Cookie time. You guys want a cookie? I guess that's a yes. Let's see. Where is the camera? There it is. You want a cookie? Is it time for cookies? All right. You can have half a cookie each. You want half a cookie? Come here, you gotta say hello to everybody. You take your cookie, go on. And you, mister, are you ready for a cookie? <laughs> You're such a good boy. You're such a good fluffer. All right, made him earn that one, didn't I? It's amazing how cooperative he is when there's food involved. Otherwise, he just ignores you. He's like, you can look at my tail for a while. All right, you got your cookie already, no. I love you both, now go the hell away. Go away. What happened to Norton Ghost? Well, ghosts, let's talk about that for a minute. The first time I cloned a hard drive, Microsoft uh, made, it, uh, made a statement that it was impossible. And I believed it. And then I tried Ghost. This is before it was owned by Symantec or Norton. Ghost stood for General Hardware Oriented Software Transfer. A lot of people don't realize that the meaning of the word ghost. And as this company became larger, it attracted the attention of a large corporation called Symantec, which also bought Norton from a gentleman named Peter Norton. He was a man who named the product after himself. And he made a lot of money, just like Jim McAfee made a lot of money off McAfee by selling it to a large corporation. Intel now owns McAfee, Symantec owns Norton, and Symantec owns Ghost. Unfortunately, Symantec more or less stopped any development with Ghost. It has not kept up. So I found a Cronus probably around 2008, 2009, and I've been using it ever since, and it makes Ghost look like Lincoln Logs. It looks like a child's toy compared to what a Cronus can do these days. And of course, there's lots of other cloning programs out there, but nothing I've seen that's as easy and as reliable as Acronis is. 
But that being said, I have no reason to ever revisit Ghost. And as far as I know, Symantec has not spent any R&D money in uh, continuing to evolve that software, and who cares? That niche has been filled over and over and over again. I used Ghost probably in 1990, maybe 95, 1990, 1994, maybe as early as 1993. I, I would say 1994 until about, I don't know when I stopped using it. Maybe 2000? I can't remember what I did for cloning between 2000 and 2008. I'm not sure what I used. I can't remember. Will the dogs go with me to Michigan? No, no. Mm -mm. I'll, I'll be renting a house for a month and I don't want to bring the dogs into somebody else's house. Even if they allowed it, I just don't think. Because Lyle, he sheds like you wouldn't believe and there'll be hair there for eternity. They'll still find hair 100 years from now. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. We, we have taken the dogs to an, a B &B that was, an Airbnb that was up in uh, Northern Arizona just for two days. That's fine, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that to the dogs. It's do keeping the environment, you know, keeping the dogs home, the dogs home is, I mean, unless you're always traveling with your dog, that's one thing. But my dogs, uh, it's kind of a little traumatic for them when you pull them from their environment for more than a day. Um, the first night trying to get the dogs to sleep is very difficult when they're in an unfamiliar area. This is hard on everybody. Martin Reed says, hello from the UK. Rick C says, they will miss you. Yeah, as long as they get their food, I think they'll be all right. Carrie, do laptop BIOS updates do any performance or what do they do? I've been told not to do them because they can break your motherboard. Uh, there's no one thing BIOS updates do. You have to read. There's always notes about what was updated in the BIOS but version, and if you're several versions behind, then the, you, you would read the updates to each version to see what they do. In some cases, it can improve performance. Uh, mostly, it improves compatibility with RAM and operating systems and hardware devices, mostly. But there have been BIOS updates that also release new features or uh, updates to existing features for those features to work more reliably or to add a little more granular controls to those features. But there's no sort of blanket statement over what BIOS updates do. It's unique to every manufacturer. And beyond that, it's unique to every BIOS update. What you need to know, or at least understand, is that it costs companies money to pay developers to write BIOS updates. And they give them away for free. So they wouldn't do it if it wasn't important. If they charged you for BIOS updates, you'd probably see a lot of them a lot more often that you'd be worried, is it worth having? So if a company is doing it at cost, at their cost to pay a developer, and then the testing, and then the download bandwidth to make it available is all coming up, who's paying for that? And so what ends up happening is after a product gets to be a certain age, the companies don't want to spend any more money for paying a developer to write a driver like on an old printer that, or an old scanner that maybe works in Windows XP, but it doesn't work in Windows 7. They don't want to spend the money. They've already sold you that product many years ago. They owe you nothing. They want you to go buy a modern scanner or a modern printer. And honestly, it's going to print so much better or scan so much faster and clearer you'll be glad you did it. And they're cheaper now than they've ever been. But that being said, um, like motherboard BIOS updates often fix uh, issues with making RAM compatible or modern CPUs compatible with a board. On a laptop, because those parts don't generally change, um, 
they're releasing the, and it's very unusual to brick a laptop with a BIOS update because the manufacturers of the laptops make that virtually impossible. BIOS updates on laptops are so easy. That being said, if you're not having any problems with your laptop, why are you even looking into it? If you want better performance, the single best upgrade you can do for your computer if you don't already have a solid state drive is to replace your current drive with a solid state drive. It'll be just like buying a new computer. Is anybody here in the chat room experienced going, taking an old computer that you felt like maybe it's time to replace it, but as a last ditch effort, you change out that old mechanical drive, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, change that mechanical drive for an SSD and then all of a sudden it's like you have a brand new computer. It runs faster than it ever ran in the entire time you've ever owned it and generally you will kick yourself for not having done it sooner. Does anybody have any stories like that they want to share in the chat? I see five pounds has been contributed by Remus Constantine. Thank you for that Remus. Remus is a moderator already. Scotty says, SSD changed my life. <laughs> Eli Ease the Game Hunter says, I just replaced my hard drive with an SSD and I'm glad I did. The PC now boots in three seconds. NGP Vlogs and stuff said, yes, it was a world of difference. Patrick Benny says he's replaced the hard drive with a solid state drive on several computers. Ben DeCour says, I did that for my aunt's laptop, hard drive to solid state. Same with my mom. They loved it. Tom Peters says, I make all my customers happy by upgrading to SSD for years now. Yes, do it. Paul1961 says, oh yes, I'll never go back. These are, I don't, you know, these people are just sharing their stories. I can't prevent somebody from typing in the chat room. It was the worst mistake I ever made. Nobody has typed that. So clearly, uh, it is 100% consensus that that is the way to go to keep an old machine. If you're, if you're looking for a performance boost, don't go looking for BIOS updates. Um, that's not going to generally not going to make a performance difference, generally. And you can see for yourself the comments are flowing in on the chat room. Um, all encouraging SSDs and sharing their ex positive experiences with using SSDs. McGoals Gaming says, I ordered a Samsung 870 today. It should be here in a week or so. I can't wait. You're, it's definitely not, there'll be no buyer's regret or buyer's remorse there. You're, you'll be very happy with it. William Dawson says, I changed my 360 gigabyte hard drive in my HP laptop to a 500 gigabyte solid state drive and it was the best move I could have made. They're so fast, they're so reliable, but primarily it's, they're just freaking fast. You know, you're looking at five times faster than a hard drive, a mechanical hard drive, and the prices are really good. Newegg has the A data the 960 gigabyte two and a half inch SSD that I keep telling you keeps going on sale. This week, just for this week, Newegg's got it for $109.99. So $110 for one gig solid state A data. I mean, it's listed as a 960 gig, but it's, it's I said one gig, it's one terabyte. Um, but they list it as 960 gigabytes. So a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. The thing is, Sometimes manufacturers report the size differently, so don't think you're getting less. It's actually the same amount as what a Samsung one terabyte drive has. Uh, it's just that they have more overhead for uh, bad cells and stuff that's being reserved. It's still the same capacity, so don't, don't let that 40 gigabyte discrepancy fool you. Thready still looking as beastly as ever. Yes, I think so. Oh wait, do we have a scammer now? Maybe this is a scammer, let's see. Hello? Hi, Mr. Holtzman, Bruce yep. Hodges again. Sorry oh. to bother you. Can, can I put you on hold uh, just a minute? Yes. 
Okay, so this is a, a customer who called me earlier, and this is a complicated situation. So I need to put you guys on hold again, um, trying to help somebody remotely. I'll tell you a little bit more about this uh, after the fact. I've got her obviously holding right now, so stick around. I'll be back here in just a minute. And Jeff Stetson just contributed $1.99. He says, have a drink on me, sir. Well, thank you, Jeff. I think I will. I'm gonna just put it back into intermission mode so you guys can continue your chat and I'll come back as soon as I uh, help this person. Okay, so what this is about is uh, I do these presentations for senior centers and you know, I always give out my business cards and it's a great way to, if you're going into business for yourself and you want to promote your business, there are usually computer clubs involving seniors pretty much in every state and probably in every country I would imagine, every first world country or you know, developed nation I guess is the right terminology. and. Um, <clears throat> met this lady and her husband had a, a sort of a macular degeneration problem where he was losing his vision. And I think I had upgraded their laptop from a hard drive to a solid state drive and we made everything really big and probably turned the co high contrast mode on and he'd have to get really, really close to the screen to see anything. And he even had a little magnifying glass, even though everything was this big. And they only come out for the summertime, or, I'm sorry, for the, they come out for the winter time. They leave their summertime home. They come to Arizona for the winter to get out of the harsh northern climate. And so they came back recently and she called me up and she said that their Yahoo mail stopped working. And I usually get these calls when people move that things don't work right when they get here. But she said, no, they've been here for about two months and this problem just started. So I said, well, it sounds like something I could probably fix remotely, but I need to have remote access to the computer. So I'm instructing her to go to teamviewer.com and she can't, she's, I'm just like, I'm telling her go to teamviewer and she's listing like search engine results. And I'm like, no, I don't want you to search for it. I want you to go to, so finally I say, okay, go to, so she gets there finally. And I'm like, you see the download button? No, I don't see a download button. And and I said, look, here's our situation. Um, this may be a problem I can help you with remotely for free. And I'm happy to do so. However, if you're not seeing a download button and I can't see your screen, I don't know what you're looking at. If you want, I'll come out and pick up the laptop and bring it back and work on it and bring it back. But I charge for that. And if you want me to do that, I'm happy to do that. Or if you know somebody in the community, your neighbor or a friend, who just is a little more computer savvy, that would help me. And we could get this done remotely, but she, she just wasn't, the, the knowledge was, uh, I think that's her calling back. Hold on a second. 
This is Carrie. So anyway, uh, that was her calling again. So I had asked her to, um, let's try ultraviewer.net. So she goes to Ultra, I go, do you see a download button? She goes, I said, do you see an orange download? She goes, no. It's like, all right, I mean, there's nothing else I can do. I don't know what you're looking at. I don't know if you're at the right way. She goes, well, I have a download button. It's not orange. I'm like, well, what color is it? She goes, it's the same color as all the other download buttons. I said, look, I'm, I'm, all right, hit the download button. Okay, now what do I do? I go, well, in the bottom left corner, you should see an indication of the process of the download. No, I don't have that. Are you looking at the very bottom left corner? Yes. I'm done. I mean, I, I, I said, I'm sorry, it's not your fault, but your screen has been modified, so it doesn't, doesn't conform to standard screens. And I don't know if you're in like black and white mode I don't know if the fonts are so big that you can't see where things are going, but I can't, there's nothing more I can do for you unless you have somebody that can come over. So she called me and said, I got somebody to come over, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning. I said, you know, I'm not up at eight o'clock in the morning. I work till two or three in the morning. About the soonest I can help you would be about 10 a.m. But if you want, I can still come out. I just charge for it. You know, there's no guarantee I can fix this remotely anyway, but um, I need to have remote access to it because it sounds like something I can fix, but I have no idea what you're looking at. And so it's impossible for me to help you until I get that remote connection established. So then she just called me back again and said, okay, um, this person said that they can be available at 10 in the morning. So I guess my work's cut out for me tomorrow morning. Uh, this is just helping somebody. They were a previous customer last year. And I'm just trying to give them good customer service. Nobody else would do this, by the way. Nobody would do this for free. I mean, the amount of, she's called me six times in the last three days. She's left four mess, well, three messages, and we've spoken three times today for free. This is what comes along with this business. But what you're gaining from it is, is goodwill. You know, she'll tell her neighbors and her friends, um, and hopefully I'll drum up real business from that. But in the meantime, I'm just trying to do the right thing and I'm trying to be thoughtful and considerate. And, you know, people aren't rich. They obviously want to save money where they can. And I certainly wouldn't mind avoiding driving in the traffic to go to where they are, to pick up their laptop, bring it back, work on it, and drive again to return it. If I can avoid it, even though I'm getting paid, the amount of money I'd be charged for that barely makes that worth my while. So <clears throat> anyway, that just kind of comes along with the business. How you choose to deal with it's up to you. This is how I run, this is how I choose to run my business. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, but I'm just letting you in on um, the, the, the way I handle customers and customer service. But even I get frustrated, you know, what I consider to be a very simple thing to go to TeamViewer and hit the download button and click the install and go next, 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 next. She can't follow that. She wasn't raised with computers. This is a, these are people that are elderly. And uh, her husband, she says, he's completely blind now. So all those changes that were made to help him see can all be undone. And whatever this Yahoo problem is that she's having with Yahoo Mail, I have no concept of what she's trying to describe to me because her internet's working fine. I had a client one of my retainer clients called me, sorry, they emailed me and they said that uh, their audio is not working on their computer. And I said, well, no, that's not what she said. She said, I need speakers. I said, what do you need speakers for? So I can hear audio. I go, well, your monitor has speakers that's built into it, like a television. She goes, well, they're not working, how come? I said, well, if we don't have an HDMI cable connected to your monitor, then we have to run a separate audio cable, but we've never hooked up audio in the office because it's annoying we agreed it would be annoying to force other people to listen to what you're listening to. Now your guys are telling me you want audio. 
She goes, we want a new monitor. I go, what kind of monitor? She goes, one where the audio works. <laughs> I, said, I said, the monitor you have now has audio. I just have to configure it for you, which I, I'm just confused. Do you want me to make the audio work on what you've got, or do you want to replace a perfectly good monitor with another monitor? Because you have the same monitor everybody else in the office has, except for the boss. She goes, yeah, he wants a new monitor too. Maybe I can have his old one. He wants one like his son has. It's a big NEC 4K monitor. I go, well, a 4K monitor may not be that nice to someone who's a bit older. It may be very difficult because everything gets smaller and sharper. Um, maybe a nice curved screen monitor, but, but why does he want, what's wrong with the monitor he's got? Well, it doesn't have sound. I said, okay, now I'm confused. I said, I've already just told you the monitors have sound, it just needs to be configured. So do you want new monitors or do you just want sound to work? Let me know because I, I just don't know how to proceed. <laughs> Am I making this more complicated than it needs to be? I, I'm, these are good people. They've been with me a long time and I don't want to be rude to them when it's the holiday season, but I don't understand. Sometimes customers tell you what they, what they want you to do to fix their problem. I don't have sound, so get me a new monitor. I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> That doesn't have anything to do with your sound problem. Yeah, PC repair is dead. Trevor says, sometimes FaceTime and Skype are very useful. No, this client, please. If I can't walk them through a simple download like TeamViewer, I don't know how the heck we're supposed to connect with Skype. That ain't happening. And most of these people have flip phones. They don't have smartphones. Jesse says, you can't make this stuff up, Carrie. Well, here's the problem. This is a good customer. I don't want to offend them or upset them. There are some business owners, the customer goes, I want a new monitor. They go, okay, no problem. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to establish what kind of monitor to recommend. He's got a big monitor on his desk right now, the owner of the company, big monitor. The man's in his 70s, okay? He doesn't have the sharpest vision. So generally, as people get older, they want it bigger. The last thing you would want is a 4K monitor. You don't want that. His son's got it because his son is a nerd, and I mean that in the best way possible. He wants Noxua fans, and he wants 4K NEC monitors on landscape mode, two of them side by side with the resolution cranked as high up as he can get it so he has as much desktop real estate as possible, which has then bled over onto his dad's, poisoning his dad's mind that he has superior equipment. He's always constantly evangelizing how great his equipment is. When we were building an office computer for his son, I explained to his father, I go, your son should either build his own computer or have a computer like everybody else, because his son was demanding basically a gaming rig. I said, you don't need this. You're, you're a lawyer. <laughs> you don't need a GTX 1080 Ti graphics card. Uh, you know, you don't need 32 gigs of RAM and Noxua fans and, and extreme coolers and liquid cooling. That's what a home user does. Your son can't seem to differentiate the difference between a home user and an office. He's a college age kid. He's not quite with the reality in the business world. If he wants that, that's fine, but I don't want to support that. So he knows what he wants. He's a kid. He can build it himself. It's no problem. And his dad says, no, no, no. No, you're a computer guy, and I just want him to have what he needs. If he doesn't need that, then don't put it in. So I built him the same thing I built everybody else in that office. And he said, well, how do I power my 4K monitor? I said, what are you talking about? Nobody said anything about a 4K monitor. He goes, yeah, I want to power two 4K monitors. I go, well, then we're going to have to add a, a discrete graphics card. He goes, all right, I'll take care of it. <laughs> and his son has password protected his computer and hasn't told me what the password is. So his computer in the office is the only one I don't touch. I don't maintain it. I don't do anything with it. Everybody else in the office, all the other employees, all conform to the standards uh, that the company, the policies and procedures of the company that I developed as their IT department. I am their IT department. But his son is an exception. I don't deal with his son's stuff. And he and I have, have argued and argued and argued. And I just, I actually told the owner of the company, I said, uh, listen, your son, um, 
he, he, he wants to build a gaming computer and he won't listen to me. And I'm worried, uh, you know, how to proceed. He goes, he says, well, then you raise him. <laughs> I wasn't exactly. I'm not saying I know how to raise a kid, and I'm not saying you didn't raise him right. What I'm worried about is if I get, if, if he and I continue this way, am I going to lose my job with you? Because I don't want to do the things he wants me to do, because I don't want to support that stuff that's not relevant to the business. And he said, absolutely not. He goes, you know what? You're my IT guy. He's my son. Whatever you say goes. I said, okay. I've just, I've lost work before, you know, from having a conflict with a family member who doesn't understand the policies and procedures that I have or what my liability is when they make those decisions and force that on me so I don't. He goes, it's fine, it's fine, we're good. I said, okay, fine. And so from that moment on, I just told his son, I'm like, you just do what you want. Just if it involves the network, call me. Don't mess with the network. And so we're good, we've been good. But now, apparently, his son has convinced his dad that his superiority of monitor is now what his dad needs. And look, it doesn't cost me any money. The customer's going to buy the equipment. I just have to install it. And I'll say, what do you want to do with the old monitors? And he'll probably say, you can keep them. So there's lots of incentive for me to replace his monitors. But the logical part of me says, why? What's wrong with what you have? And if the customer gets a sense that you're being difficult or argumentative, it's a quick way to lose a customer. The customer might say, look, I've asked you to do it, now just do it. Maybe. But I feel like the reason people hire me is to save them money and to understand what their needs are. Because if they understood what their needs are, they wouldn't need me. A lot of times they just get their brain poisoned by family, friends, or coworkers that say you need this when they don't need it at all. And when the family, friend, or coworker isn't responsible for maintaining it, it falls on me. So I'm trying to save them money and, and I'm trying to increase their productivity. And sometimes that costs me jobs. Sometimes I lose customers because the cu some customers just want you to do what they tell you to do. And I advise those customers to go find a Craigslist tech they're good at being told what to do and just do it. They may not do it well and they may not do it fast, but they'll be free from any ideas as to how to improve your business or save your money. People come to me when you want to increase your productivity and let somebody else make the decisions that are right for the IT department for the company so you can focus on what you're educated at, which in this case is being a lawyer. You go be a lawyer, I'll be the IT guy, let me handle this stuff. And for the customers that accept that arrangement, um, it's very productive for everybody involved. There's no arguing, there's no, this customer's always been really good. If I say, look, we need to replace the server, boom, server gets replaced. And as a result, we have, we've had zero downtime, zero lost data, no problems at all. He never questions it. And sometimes he even says, is that good enough? Are you just trying to save me money? Is there something better than that we can buy? And I always have the same discussion. I go, there's always something better, but it's not gonna benefit you. In other words, there's, if you bought a car and you said, is there a better version of the car? I go, yeah, there's an 800 horsepower version of the car, but you don't drive a car like that. So it would benefit you zero to have it. So why would you spend that money? That's the sort of typical conversations we have. So when a dialogue like this comes up where they tell me they need a new monitor, it starts with, I need speakers. And I say the speakers are built into the monitor. Then they say, I need a new monitor. Why do you need a new monitor? Because the speakers aren't working. But I already said the speakers weren't configured. So do you want me to come out and configure the speakers? Because if you buy a new monitor, we're still right back where we were regarding speakers. <laughs> it doesn't solve anything. Remember, I'm not selling the monitors. There's, there's no positive or negative for me one way or the other. It's not a big deal to install. Take it out of the box, put it on a desk, give it power, plug it in. Done. So I'm, I, it's not that I'm uh, you know, debating with them over doing the work. It's not much for work. I'm trying to justify why are you spending this money? What's your end goal? Don't tell me how to get to the end goal. If your end goal is to have your speakers work, then I'll hook up a speaker cable or we'll get an HDMI cable. Well, one of those two things will fix it. 
So that's today. That was all, everything I've just told you about was just today. But remember, um, there's a difference between being an employee and being a consultant, right? So if you're, if you're gonna hire a consultant and treat them as an employee, you've hired the wrong person. You hire a consultant when you go, look, I don't know anything about this, and if you explain it to me, I won't understand it. But let me tell you what my needs are, and you tell me, you know, give me an estimate as to what it's gonna cost to get this implemented and to function to my expectations. That's what a consultant does. Consultant says, let me understand what your business needs are, where's your budget, and let me find the right solution for you. If you wanna tell somebody how to do it, then you wanna hire an employee, not a consultant. These are two different things. So the difference is liability. When you hire an employee and the employee does what you tell them to do and it doesn't work, it's your fault, it's your problem, not the employee. The employee goes, hey, I just did what you asked me to do, it's not my problem. Then you might say, well, fix it. And the employee might go, I don't know how to fix it. I didn't, wasn't my idea to do this. It was your idea. You, I don't know. I did what you asked me to do. That's what an employee is. A consultant, you, that scenario never happens. A consultant says, okay, I'm going to put this equipment in. I'm going to show you how to use it. You're good to go. If you have any problems, call me. So, yeah, there's a, you wouldn't go to a doctor and say, you're going to prescribe me this medication. No doctor in the world seeing you for the very first time, generally speaking, is gonna prescribe what you want. They're gonna say, tell me what your symptoms are and what you're trying to fix, and let me use my education and experience as a doctor to tell you or recommend to you what prescriptions you should be taking. And who knows, maybe at the end of it, I'll agree with you that what you want is ideal. But, especially when it comes to things like painkillers, Doctors are very, very cautious these days of writing those prescriptions, and it's for the same reason I won't do certain things with computers, is liability. People really don't understand the importance of liability until it happens. And then they start talking about lawsuits. And we live in a world where, at least here in America, it's a very litigious society. And so when somebody hires me as a consultant, I take on a huge amount of liability that everything has to work properly and has to be maintained to operate according to what was agreed upon between me and the client. Whereas with an employee, you could pay an employee a lot less, tell them what to do, if you know what needs to be done, and then continue to hire people endlessly to get it working the way you want it to work. It's two sides of the same coin. One's just a lot harder, takes a lot longer, and costs a lot more money. The other side is you delegate it, and you step away and let somebody do their job. Working with somebody who micromanages me doesn't work. Because if you know how to do my job, then you do it. You don't need me. Let's save ourselves both some frustration and time. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I want a customer to be happy with their decision. And if the customer thinks they know better than I do, then we're both better off if we go separate ways. One way or another, I'm gonna have a happy customer, even if it means not having that customer. Why don't they plug in headphones? You know, that's a good question, Shane. Um, I don't know. They don't wear headphones at the office. But what happened was somebody recently started at this office, a new employee that I think is related to the owner. And she put, without my permission, she put Spotify on the computer. And it starts every time the computer starts. And I was going to say something, but it's not hurting anything. It's not like the days when people were putting Napster on their computers, um, you know, that was causing a liability concern for lawsuits to the company, not to me. Although, if I was their consultant, it would come back to me, potentially. So, um, 
I think, so, you know, it's monkey see, monkey do. They walk into her office that she shares with another person, by the way. These offices have two people in each one. And I go, well, she's got it, so I want it too. And here we are. Now, the boss, super nice guy. I've known him a long time. You know, they, they, they talk about how bad lawyers are as people, but this guy, he's a good guy. He really is. Uh, he's the kind of lawyer that likes to try and get everything done outside of the court. He doesn't want to go to court. He wants to compromise and negotiate as much as possible. He's an injury attorney. He, he doesn't want to go to court. Most injury attorneys do want to go to court. They want to manipulate a jury and squeeze every ounce out. Uh, he, he's one of these attorneys, he doesn't, he, he would rather work with the insurance companies or work with the parties and try and find an amicable solution and avoid a courtroom. You don't find many people like that in law today, but they do exist. There are good attorneys out there. They're hard to find, but they do exist. He's a very good guy. I like him a lot. And at this time right now, he is the oldest retainer I have. I've had no retainer as long as I've had him as a client. So I obviously don't want to lose him as a client, certainly not over a silly, solu a silly communication issue like this. And, you know, there's always that sort of debate as to the dialogue, how far you take the dialogue. Do you, do you, do you just say, okay, hey, my speakers aren't working. Okay, I'll take care of it and end the story. Or, well, she didn't say my speakers aren't working. She said, I don't have speakers. Well, no, because they're built into this monitor. Well, they don't work. Okay, well, it wasn't hooked up. All right, so I'm getting a new monitor. Why, why are you getting a new monitor? Because the speakers don't work. Speakers do it. So there's a certain point where you go, okay, maybe the right answer is I'll take care of it and just leave it. <laughs> and then go and install the audio cable or an HDMI cable and be done with it instead of having this long drawn out dialogue. The reason I have the dialogue is to meet my customer's expectations. The last thing I want to do is go and install, you know, take the drive out to the client office, do the work, run a cable, make sure the monitor volume is up, make sure the PC volume is turned up, and that it's gonna work. So when they come into work, it works, only to find them saying, oh, there's no subwoofer. Well, wait a minute, you're in an office, why would you want a subwoofer? So I'm trying to isolate and, and remove all of the obstacles to understand what their expectations are. What is it that you want? Don't tell me how to get there. Don't say I want speakers. That's, no, don't tell me that. Tell me what, what's the speaker's gonna do for you? Are you gonna listen to bings and blips from Windows? Or are you gonna listen to music, watch videos? What's the purpose here? And let me do my job with my years and years of experience to find the right solution for you. That's what you pay me for. But that sometimes creates a little frustration in communication, as I've just explained. So we'll see how this plays out. Shane says, it's envy of what someone else has. There's an expression for that, FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty unusual that this office has never really done that before. And it's one of the reasons when I build computers for an office, they all get the same case. I use that Corsair 200R and the internal components are different. And that's because if somebody's got a fancy case, then they've got the nicer computer. How come they got a nicer computer than me? But when all the boxes are identical, never, not once has anybody said somebody else's computer was better than theirs. Despite the fact that some of those computers are five and six years old and some of them are just a few months, you know, two, three months old. But you can't tell by looking at them. But you should be able to tell when you sit down and start using it. One's gonna be blazing fast and the older one's gonna be slower. But because of the kind of work that they do, it's a lot of legal documents and, and spreadsheets and PDF files. 
they don't notice an NVMe drive from a hard drive. They don't even notice it at all. You can give them a five gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, they don't, it's all the same. They're still typing the same speed. Word documents still pretty much load over the speed of the network, no matter how fast the computer is. And um, I've done everything in my power to keep that sort of envy from happening. Everybody has the same monitor, except for the boss and his son. So the boss has a big single screen and the son has these two NEC 4K monitors that I know his son is just telling him how superior his screen is compared to everybody else's. It drives me crazy. Just because you like something doesn't mean other people will like it too. You gotta have the hot chicken wings. I don't like spicy food. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. It's far superior to, to whatever that crap is you're eating. And then over and over, day after day, it wears people down. All right, give me the spicy chicken wings. You're gonna be sorry. Have you tried installing Windows 10 Pro N bloatware free? N is not bloatware free. Um, N, the N version of Windows removes like media player. The European Union decided that Microsoft including that was monopolizing. And it creates a lot of problems for people when they install Windows, the N version, the letter N like Nancy. They go, how come my videos don't play? How come YouTube doesn't work? Because you installed the N version it's a lot more work for you to have to fix it. I advise you not to install the end version unless you like doing all the extra work. If you're a technical person and you like that sort of thing, then you already know. There's no sense listening to me. But if you're a regular person with a computer and you want to frustrate yourself and enforce yourself to learn computers, you go ahead and install that end version. Enjoy that. You can thank the European Union at the end of the day. Send them the bill for your time. I don't think media player is bloatware. There's no, the bloatware would be like Candy Crush, you know, that sort of nonsense. Let me see if, uh, if my customer has responded to me. Give me just a minute here, guys. Give me just a second.
Okay, so apparently that last email, which was me trying to discern if they're wanting new monitors or if they're just wanting sound, has apparently thrown them into some kind of a weird loop where they have not responded. I, apparently, uh, you know, any major purchases have to be authorized by the owner. I enabling sound, that doesn't cost anything. I just come over there and hook a cable up. So I think I'm probably going to have to drive over to the office tonight after they close and when traffic dies down and just go and hook up the sound for the owner and this employee and see if the problem goes away. I think that's what I need to do because their lack of communication, it's been several hours and their lack of any response to me trying to figure out what the hell it is they want is not a good sign. That is generally a sign that uh, they are trying to convey something to me that I'm not getting or I'm trying to convey something to them that they're not getting. Or they require, and when I responded to the employee, I carbon copied, I CC'd her boss, so he's in on this conversation. And I've not heard from either one of them now, which has me a little concerned. So I, this is not a priority service call, this is not involving any productivity concern. It's not like the server is down or something like that, which would be a serious issue. But I am concerned that the mentality of people during the holiday season, during the month of December, pretty much starting from around the third week of November when Thanksgiving comes to December, people get weird. They get demanding, they get impatient, they get intolerant, they start making unusual requests. And if it's any other customer, I just say tough luck. But when it's a retainer, I want to keep that retainer. I want them to come back. And if they make unreasonable requests or what I think is unreasonable demands, it's sometimes just easier to do it than to try and work any sense out of it. So I think I'm going to have to go over there and bring a couple audio cables or HDMI cables and get the audio on. I can already imagine what the next call is going to be, which is how do we get the audio off? Because it's really annoying everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Sometimes you just have to, you know, deal with it and watch the consequences. I'm trying to avoid the train wrecking, but they're insisting on running the trains together. Okay, there's your trains. And as again, as a consultant, it's my job to inform them. But when it gets to be contentious, I get a little worried. And it's a very simple request, but it's not an urgent request. But the more I postpone it the, during this time of year, the more intolerant they'll get, the more unforgiving they'll get. And I could lose the retainer over something so stupid. Um, but the fact that they have not responded, they were, we were going back and forth, and then all of a sudden, all the communication stopped. It's never a good sign. Carrie, do the employees think you're being confrontational by asking them questions? I, you know, I don't know um, because I can't see their face and I can't hear their tone of voice. I'm reading in a text. Uh, I've had employees be very short with me that I interpret as them being upset when in fact they're just busy and giving me a quick response. And because I... I I've been blindsided too many times. I'd rather assume the worst and be wrong than assume the best and be wrong. So I don't know, but, but the communication stopping suddenly and for hours, you know, for all I know, maybe the employee went home early or maybe they're busy working and they don't have time to deal with this right now. Maybe they're frustrated. Maybe they understood me the whole time but they're just not communicating in a level that I can understand. I can't recommend a monitor if I don't know what the shortcoming is of the monitor you've got now. If it's just audio, buying a new monitor doesn't fix that. And how do you explain the other employees and the other, there's at least two other employees that have audio built into their monitor working and everybody else has the same monitor. So why do they think they don't have audio? So yeah, this, this happens, it just happens. And luckily it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's frustrating not just for me, but for them as well. 
And frustration is not generally a good thing uh, when you're in business with a customer. It's just not good for either, either person. Nobody's happy. Have you installed your Nuka Office PC yet? No, the Nuka is in its box. I have so much work to do. Uh, I probably won't get the Nuka out of its box until after the first of the year based on how busy things are right now, but we'll see. I'd like to. <laughs> Ken in the chat room says, I find computer monitor speakers are poor sound quality. Well, remember, we're in an office and two people share the same office space, like there's one desk against one wall and one desk against another. And your selfishness about your audio quality may be the nightmare for the person that has to share the office and endure the nonsense and the crap that, in their opinion, is what you're listening to. So, you know, if you listen to what somebody else says is crap, there's no such thing as sound quality if somebody else doesn't agree with it. It's just louder. Uh, that's our main concern is volume in an office. And if you have to endure, like when I worked, <laughs> when I worked at the power company, I used to have to sit next to a cubicle with a person that listened to NPR all day long. It was like office space with Milton. <laughs> it was torture for me, torture. So I, I think it's just really rude and inconsiderate to be running audio through speakers in an office. That's my personal feelings, unless you have your own individual office. But if you're sharing office space, it's profoundly inconsiderate of other people around you. It's not about sound quality. It's about consideration. And generally speaking, it volumes low enough that two people in the same room don't have to listen to it. Quality is the least of your concern. Now, if, if my customer is a music studio, <laughs> that's a different story. If, if we're in a production booth and we're hooking up monitor speakers for the musicians and we're gonna be have a mixing booth for the, for the producing of music, then that needs very specialty high-end audio equipment that's designed by a sound engineer, not by a computer technician. And remember, they've been a client of mine now for over 10 years. This has never been an issue before. They've gone for 10 years without audio. What changed? And what new problems are we going to have as a result of enabling it? We'll see. Because apparently we're going down that road. Now the boss, you know, the boss I'm not worried about. The boss has the biggest office. It's all him and nobody else is in there. And he's got a door he can close. And he works late hours and weekends, which very few employees do. So who wouldn't want to be able to, you know, crank it up and enjoy your time at work, especially if you're the owner? So again, this is all thanks, my guess is, it's thanks to this recent employee who installed Spotify and now everybody wants to listen to music and there's gonna be a, a cacophony of sounds when this is all done, which is gonna be very off-putting to any customers coming into that office. And I suspect within six months, the next request will be, how do we get these speakers out of here? It's hurting business. You know, sometimes you can see all of this happening and no matter what you say, they're just not going to listen to you. Which is ironic, given the subject of what we're talking about. <laughs> they want to listen to music. They don't want to listen to me. Okay. Christoph Esch has contributed five euro cookies for Lyle and Jimmy and a Coke for me. Well, thank you, Christoph. Cheers, Christoph. 
Have I sent the Australian PC yet? Let me tell you what happened with the Australian PC. Reviewer contacted me and he says, I'm with a logistics company and I agree the amount of money that FedEx and DHL are charging you or wanting to charge you is offensive. Why don't you call the Phoenix office of the logistics company that I work for? We can get you a much better price. So I called the Phoenix office of this logistics company and they said, uh, what's the name of your company? And I said, well, it's not really a company, it's just me working. And he goes, well, we can't ship it. Okay. So I emailed the guy back. I said, I mean, it's your company. The title says you're a supervisor. I assume you know what the rules of your company are, but your employee that I called at the Phoenix office said you can't ship from an individual. And he said, uh, let me look into that for you. So about four days went by, and I'm sitting on this thing. I'm waiting, you know, a guy from Australia is asking, what's the status of this? Obviously, he doesn't want to spend $1,200 to ship it. So I emailed him back. I go, did you ever find anything out? Because we're just all in limbo waiting. He goes, I ran into the same wall of a human being that you did. It is illegal for us to ship a computer from an individual. And I told him that you, you would form a company and would ship it that way. And he said, it can't be done. So I tried and I apologize for wasting your time. So we're right back to where we started from. This is an important lesson for you guys to learn that live in other countries, that you think it's gonna be cheaper if you order from another country and have it shipped. Perhaps if it's all in the European Union, going from one European Union um, partner to another is fine, but when you're going from the United States uh, to Asia or the European Union or any of these other, you know, Australia, things get really expensive. And it is done that way with intention. Your governments don't want you superseding their taxes, and they will find a way to punish you if you try to circumvent their policies. This is what all governments do. Every country that I'm aware of does this. Some countries are a bit more assertive and aggressive at that, like Brazil is extraordinarily expensive to bring anything into Brazil. It's about a 50% tariff. So this customer, they had about a 5,000 US dollar budget on the build, and we built it for around 3,200. If we spend $1,200 to ship it, his build's now at 4,400, and then he's gonna to have to pay a tariff when it arrives in Australia. It'll take 15 days to arrive in to Australia from Phoenix, and it will probably sit in customs for 15 days before they call or let him know what the fees are to pick it up. Um, this is a computer, a keyboard, a mouse, an external DVD drive. Everything on the customs form has to be listed. And then they will determine a tariff on that. Then he'll pay the tariff, and if he picks it up and all he hears are parts rattling inside, too bad. Not much I can do to help him. And I warned him of all of this before we started, and he was more than willing to take the risk. And I'm more than willing to have the experience, and he has apologized for putting me in this position, because it's really, um, I spent a whole lot of time investigating this and making phone calls and talking to people and just trying to find another avenue, even potentially buying a plane ticket and flying to Australia with the computer is about the same amount of money, minus hotel and rental car, things like that. <clears throat> so, you know, look, if it all arrives okay and in one piece, well, I'll know exactly what to tell people. I'll know this is what it's going to cost. This is how long it's going to take to ship. This is how long it sits in customs. This is how much your tariff is. You still want to order from me from another, another country? If you're okay with all that, I'm okay with it. Ned Curtis has contributed $2. Hey, Ned, thank you for your contribution. Import duties apply for countries that have no reciprocal agreement. Yeah, well said. I shipped a used laptop to England. It cost me $130 to ship. 
and my friend had to pay 160 to get it out of customs. Yeah, that's how it works. What if I ship the computer to England and from England have it shipped to Australia? You think it'd still be in one piece? Would that, you think that glass side panel isn't gonna crack or shatter? Going over the ocean twice? I don't know, that's pretty creative though. You'd have to pay customs fees twice. You'd have to pay the customs fee in England and then you'd pay the customs fee again in Australia and you'd be paying shipping twice. You'd pay shipping to England and then England to Australia. I think it would end up not only taking probably two months just in shipping, but the likelihood for damage would be much higher and I believe the expense would be higher. But I don't know, I'm guessing. Will the AC power work the same in Australia? Yeah, modern power supplies automatically convert. They sense what's coming in and adapt. There's no, there's no switches anymore. All you need is the right cable to, you know, to plug into the wall and the power supply does the rest. And it's a Seasonic power supply. It's auto switching. Those, those are the problems you had in the 80s and 90s. We don't have those problems today unless you're buying cheap junk. Kevin says, you'll probably have to sell his PC and give him back the money. It seems like it's too much to ship. Yeah, there's not too many people lining up to spend $3,000 on a computer, and the longer I sit on it, the more it potentially depreciates in value. Price of RAM has come down. The price of SSDs have come down. It's going to be a hit one way or the other. It could be a $1,200 loss to sell it or a $1,200 loss to ship it. But again, I set all these expectations up with the customer before I agreed to do the job. I wanted to paint a worst case scenario. This computer was built and finished in what, the first week of October? And now we're into the first week of December and it still hasn't shipped. It's just completed and sitting here collecting dust. It's done. I've never had this problem before. But I've never shipped to another country before. And this is exactly what I was afraid of. I was afraid of the problems getting it shipped. I'm afraid of the damage that can be caused in that kind of shipping. And I'm afraid of what the tariffs are gonna be. So number one fear, the first fear has already come true. Second and third fears, we'll see, we'll see. Um, mark the package as a gift. You can do that with inexpensive items, but when, like I sent a digital SLR camera to a friend in England and I marked it as a gift, but even when you mark something as a gift, you have to write a value down and you have to write what the item is. Now, we're not dealing with ignorant people. They know they can type in Google what the item is and hit the for sale and see what that item average price goes for and then there's a gift tax that can be applied or a value tax to the gift. It's just not that simple. You're not dealing with idiots. They have a job to do and they have rules to follow or they can lose their job because you're too cheap to follow the rules or you're trying to find a loophole to get away with will likely end, you, end up with you paying even more or not getting what was shipped. They could say you've lied on the customs form and we're confiscating it. Is that worth it? Not if you're a business. <laughs> Not a good way to run a business. So, you know, what you do personally is different. What you do in a business comes back to liability to the customer, uh, for you to the customer. And I can't emphasize that enough. Gary Kane has contributed $5. He says, I built four computers in the last three months thanks to you. My daughters and I appreciate all your help. That's awesome, Gary. That's good to hear. Patrick says he shipped that laptop to the UK as a gift and it still had fees. Yeah, so just writing gift. <laughs> Again, if it's something cheap and small, if it's a flashlight, a product sample, that's one thing. But once you exceed a certain dollar value, I think once you exceed $100, I don't know what the limit is. I think it varies, but I think it's safe to say 100 bucks. there's going to be a tax on it, a tariff, no matter what. I don't care what you write on it. And if you lie on it, they could take it. They have every right that you violated the law, you're a criminal, and they're keeping that and confiscating it. Um, so if you're going to break the law, then you can't complain about your punishment. 
You don't get to decide your punishment. It's not, you can't punish yourself. It doesn't work like that. And whatever punishment you get is exactly what you deserve. You don't get to say it's too much punishment. No, it isn't. You should have thought about that before you committed the crime. It's important we do everything legal if we want to be in business tomorrow. I mean, look, I, I want to keep my customer happy, but I don't want to go out of business doing it. Can you find a local company that knows you who would be willing to ship it? It is illegal for somebody who knows me to ship it. It is completely illegal. So it would have to be a registered company with a registered um, employer identification number issued by the United States government to legally ship it in the manner that you just suggested. Shipping internationally, a package of this size and weight from one individual to another has to be done through a consumer carrier like FedEx, DHL, UPS. If you're going with a logistics company, it has to be the, a company, one company. It, it can go to an individual, that's fine, but it has to come from uh, a registered company with the United States government. So if I, if I had registered my company with an employee identification number and I was, for example, incorporated, it wouldn't have this problem. But it's a lot of money and a lot of tax paperwork to get all that set up. Basically, we're looking at shipping a box that is uh, 24 inches by 24 inches by 24 inches. So figure 24 inches squared. It'll weigh about 65 pounds. And a lot of times when you guys get these prices online, um, you're getting prices that are from logistics companies that can only, if it's a logistics company, it, it has to ship only company products like like Dell, for example, can use a logistics company. I can't use a logistics company. That's law. I have to use a consumer-based shipper. Now, I'm not saying I know everything about it. I don't. That's the problem. I'm trying to figure all this out. But basically, I'm, I've been informed from three different parties that it has to go through a consumer shipper. So whatever that means, you know, whatever that price is, it is. Brendan Looney's contributed five pounds. He says, have a Coke on me. Well, thank you, Brandon. Brendan. And Ben DeCure has contributed $4.99. He says, hey, Carrie, hope you're doing well. Good to see you. Hey, thank you, Ben. Send it part by part. <laughs> well, he could have just ordered parts if he was going to do that. What do you want to ship? I'm trying to ship one of those Nuka-Cola computers. So basically, it's a computer, a keyboard, a mouse, a DVD drive, uh, the motherboard box. The whole thing all together will be in one big box. It'll be 24 inches by 24 inches by 24 inches. So 24 inches cubed. It'll weigh about 65 pounds. And it needs to go from Phoenix to Tasmania, Australia. That's all I'm trying to do. I wouldn't have thought in the world, I would have never thought it was going to be this complicated. I knew it was going to be more complicated than shipping domestically, but I had no idea it was going to be at this level. I've spent more time on trying to get this thing shipped than I spent on building it. This is all. The, the difference is I knew what I was doing when I was building it. I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to the shipping stuff and, uh, out, you know, international shipping. Um, it's really thrown me for an unexpected loop. Uh, was not expecting so much expense to ship something. You know, it's under 100 pounds. It's one person can carry it. I don't know why it's so expensive.
can I get a custom computer palleted? I, again, usually these big shipping companies have a minimum 100 pounds. We'd have to add another 30, 35 pounds of weight. Um, but yeah, it'd be great if I could pallet the thing, put it on a wooden pallet, shrink wrap it around the wooden pallet and ship it like cargo. Unfortunately, when you add all that expense, you're right back to where you are with FedEx or DHL without any of that. And, and all, I mean, I've tried it. I've tried working the numbers either way. And the main concern I have with the logistics companies is even if I could do it, and even if it were cheaper, it would still be illegal. Can you reduce the size? That's as small as it's going to get. You know, the Nuka Cola case has a glass tempered glass panel. Um, it stands about as tall as this computer here. And then it's got to have a keyboard and a mouse and a DVD drive and the motherboard box all piled onto it. So, and there's got to be some packing material in there, right? I can't imagine getting it any smaller than 24 inches by 24 by 24. I don't see it being possible. Not without a hammer or a saw. Time for a boat trip, that'd be great. Why can he not pick it up? You know, he mentioned that, you know, he could fly out to the US, but when he factors in the rental car fees and the hotel fees, it's just too much money. It's cheaper to, uh, to ship it. Uh, you gotta remember, the, the governments have got this all, this is not the first rodeo. The, people try to work this system and manipulated it for so many years now that the governments have applied policies and procedures to, to ensure that no matter which way you do it, they're going to get their cut one way or the other. That's the conclusion I've come to. When am I going to install Windows 10? I think we're probably going to have to do that tomorrow now that we're running out of time and I, my UPS guy still hasn't arrived. It said it's been in my neighborhood for the last hour and a half. I don't know how many, was he stopping at every house? In any event, um, I'll have to do this tomorrow because we had too many interruptions today. So I'm going to leave everything as it is and then I'll do the Windows 10 install, show you what the install process is along with the little minor changes that I make in Windows and that'll be a video for tomorrow. In the meantime, we're just handling questions and answers here in the chat room for about another 10 minutes and we're going to wrap it up for today. comments coming in today. What if he flies to a nearby country and you ship it there? The problem that we run into is if we ship it to another country, we don't know how long that country will hold on to it in customs. And the country, you know, we have to have an address to ship to. Like if he knew somebody in another country that we could ship it to, that they can be informed by customs when the package arrives and then they can pay the fee and collect the package and he can come out to visit them and take the package home with him. Things get real complicated. Real, like I said, the governments have sealed this all every way. Every avenue you look at, it's already been covered. Um, it's, you know, going to have to think a lot more creatively than that. 
And what country is near Australia anyway? What country did you have in mind? New Zealand? The, the French islands there, the, pal, the uh, what are they called? Can't think of what they're called. Yeah, it's going to be very, there's just nothing around Australia as far as I know, other than water. Perry says, I thought the Nuka-Cola didn't have a bay for a DVD drive. Yeah, it's an external USB DVD drive. That's why it's being included separately in that part of the computer. That's why I mentioned it. Why would I mention it if it was built in? That doesn't make any sense. Sumit Honda says, hello from Toronto. Welcome in, Sumit. Solo says, just use FedEx and be done with it. Yeah, well, apparently that's the only choice I have at this point, because as long as FedEx packs it, then if it arrives damaged, they can't say the packing wasn't good enough, and they'll have to reimburse the owner of the computer for something. I don't know that they'll give him full reimbursement, but they'll have to reimburse something. Nobody else will do that other than if they pack it. DHL doesn't offer a packing service. So at the end of the day, it's probably going to be FedEx. And um, I, I really wanted to get this out last month because now everybody's shipping everything right now and they're busy. And when they're busy, they don't tend to handle the products very carefully. They handle them quickly. And there's greater concern for damage this time of year. And if I was this customer, who paid for this system in September and I built it in October and now it's December and it still hasn't shipped. And look, he, he understands the situation. He was warned of this before we began. I discouraged him from ordering it. I told him I didn't think it was a good idea, but if he wanted to do it with all of these, you know, consequences being possible, if he was willing to accept those potential consequences, I'd be happy to build it because it would be a learning experience for me, and I would share that with you guys, and that's exactly what's happening. So in the future, when people ask me if I will ship a computer to Europe or Australia or Canada or Mexico or Japan, you already know what the answer is going to be, and you know why. And it's just very discouraging that the governments have colluded together to make this so disparaging. So you're going to have to suck it up and pay it. And he'll pay it. Don't get me wrong. He will pay it. But we all agree it's far more than anybody thought. We thought it was going to be maybe 600 bucks. It's twice that. And Lord only knows what the tariffs are going to be when it arrives. And hopefully it arrives in one piece. Rick is mentioning a SanDisk 256 gig uh, USB flash drive for $85. Yeah, 
Yeah, but it's too big. It's too bulky. You can get a, a sand disk like this with the little 256 gigs at Newegg. No, at Amazon, it's like $80, $85. And it's small. It's tiny. You know, when they're that big, they're hard to get room to, to plug into the back of the USB port on many computers. It's crowded back there. Ben is asking a question about overclocking. I don't support overclocking, and I won't answer questions on overclocking. If you want to shoot yourself in the foot, you can do that without my assistance. I appreciate that you're a fan of the show, and I like that, and I, and I do, but honestly, this isn't the right channel for that kind of discussion. Uh, there are probably others in the chat that can give you some advice, but my advice is don't overclock it. You can spend that money on the cooler and the RAM, spend it on a faster processor, and you won't have to worry about blowing things up, causing things to overheat and break. Um, generally speaking, on most computers, the thing that needs to be overclocked is the end user. You are the slowest part of a modern computer. But if you're interested in just doing that for fun and a hobby, I would recommend you go to an overclocker forum specifically for the discussion of overclocking among like-minded individuals. It's nothing I want to get involved in here. It's too risky with very little benefit and a lot of expense and a huge, huge consumption of time. So yeah, I'm not gonna entertain that here. He will get taxed 15% on top of the final price. It'll be the most expensive PC he ever bought. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. See, I don't know. See, like, so the keyboard and mouse he wanted he weren't for sale in Australia. There was no other way for him to get them other than to have me buy it and then ship it to him. I don't know why, but that's what he said. And the Australian dollar, you know, is not equal to the American dollar, so I don't know what the equivalent system would cost in Australia. I think at the end of the day, it's going to cost him, I don't think it's going to be the most expensive. I, I think it's going to cost him a little bit more. But he wanted it built by me. So what's that worth? You know, you got to keep that in mind too. Greg says, if you, someone in the U.S. sends something to Canada, there's a 13% tax assessed. Interesting. Even if it's tariff-free, duty-free, huh? Um... The, the customer in Australia will pay the $1,200 shipping, but I think everybody agrees it doesn't sound right. The shipping seems way, way, way too much for the size and weight of what we're shipping. And the customer will pay whatever, you know, if the shipping's $10,000, he'll pay it. He committed to it. He committed to it, and he's going to stand by his word. There's no concern that the customer is not going to pay for the shipping. That's not a concern. My concern is whether or not the customer is paying a fair amount for the shipping. And it appears that he is. It appears that that's normal. That's what's so surprising. No matter who I call and who I talk to, it keeps taking me back to where I started. Andrew, who has one of the new Coca-Cola builds that I did, I shipped it to him in Pennsylvania, and he's in the chat today, and he says, I haven't even taken it out of the box. So, hopefully it arrived okay. 
Does that shipping charge include insurance? I don't remember. I've talked to so many different places about the fees that I can't remember. I just remember it was about $1,200 at FedEx specifically. That number sticks with me. But what we were talking about, if that include insurance or not, I don't remember. So it's $1.38 Australian to each $1 US. Oh, it's not as bad as I thought it was. William says, ship the computer to me, have him fly to Portland, I'll pick him up at the airport, he can stay overnight at my house, I'll feed him and he can fly back the next day. Well, that's awfully generous to offer to a complete stranger from another country. And if you get murdered, I don't need that liability. I don't think Rodney would hurt you. But that would be, um, that would be something a friend would do for another friend. You know, um, I don't know Bill. I mailed a computer to Bill. And I don't know Rodney. And I'm sure we're all nice people. But I think that's awfully risky to open your home to a complete stranger with no benefit in it to you other than to be a nice person. And I'm sure it would work out just fine. However, however, if it didn't, that would be a potentially huge liability on my part. So while I appreciate the generosity and kindness of your offer, I cannot extend that to the customer. It's just, that's too, and not only that, but he'd still have to get it home. You know, he'd still have to worry about the airline tossing it onto the plane and potentially breaking it that way too. So even then it can still get damaged, but that's a very kind offer. Unrealistic, but kind. Andrew says, I think the Nuka-Cola is okay. I don't hear anything rattling around inside the box. Well, you should hear, like, the motherboard box is in there with all the parts in there, and that'll rattle around a little bit. Go start a GoFundMe page for shipping? No, again, like, it's not that the customer doesn't have the money. It feels like it's a ripoff. It feels like he's being overcharged. That's the problem. The customer budgeted $5,000 for the system. And after I talked to him, I figured out, you know, he doesn't need this extraordinary system that's going to be headaches to maintain. And you've seen the struggles I've had with Threadripper that I don't have with you know, regular consumer-based processors from Intel and AMD. But when you get into these super high-end processors, they get really finicky over the RAM you use, over the settings, everything gets super finicky. So, um, you know, there's that bleeding edge is uh, very difficult sometimes to maintain any sort of performance reliability on. So it's really not an issue with the money as it is an issue of the amount of being fair for what we're getting in return. It doesn't seem fair doesn't seem justified. But again, from all my research, apparently it is fair and justified. I just am not familiar with the process. And neither is the customer. We're both shocked. And the customer, customer gave me the green light to ship at FedEx and he'll reimburse me. That's when I was emailed from this other person that runs a logistics company and even he didn't know the rules. And he's a supervisor of a logistics company and he didn't know. So what does that say? At the end of the day, though, it took me right back to where I started from and just wasted time. It wasted a week and a half of, or two weeks of time trying to get an answer from somebody who, I mean, if they don't know, how am I supposed to know? So which brought us right back to FedEx again. So I'll probably have to take it to FedEx, let them box it and ship it out and be done with it. In fact, at this point, I'm going to check it for, before I ship it, I'll have to update the video card driver, look for any new BIOS updates, and just give it one more power up and go through before I ship it because it's sat for how many weeks has it been?
send it as a second passenger. Yeah, airlines don't allow that. William says, I'm a retired cop. I'm not worried, and you're under no liability. Again, uh, it's a nice offer, but I, I can't, I can't. This, this is a business, and I can't, you know, when friends are helping friends, that's all well and good, but um, I'm not going to do that. And I do appreciate the gesture. It's a very nice gesture. It's very generous of you. It's very kind of you. Um, but I can't, I, I just can't go down that road. Has Tech Vets died? No. Mm -mm. Mike and I only do a couple of Tech Vets episodes every year. As long as the Tech Vet site is up, we're still around. Mike has been very, very busy lately. He's had a lot of things going on. I have been very busy. And we don't charge anything for Tech Vets. It's something we do for the sheer joy and pleasure of doing it. And as a result, you know, when, with the, when we're busy helping customers and making a living, that takes priority over having fun with Tech Vets. We will do another Tech Vets um, when time permits. It's just the way our schedules are right now. And of course, this is always a very busy time of year. We've always tried to do an episode at the end of the year. We've always tried like that, that week between Christmas and New Year's where we have that sort of a week where everything kind of slows down. We usually squeeze a show in. I will say that I've sent e emails to Mike about eight times in the last four months, and I've only gotten two replies. So I don't know what's going on, and I'm not going to push it. If he's that busy, then he's busy. Uh, and I'm not going to put it all on Mike and say it's Mike's fault, but I am going to tell you that I recently sent him an email that said, how about we do another Tech Vets podcast, and I got no response. When I talked to him about money, he responded right away. So I'm assuming things are just really busy for him right now, and so he's got to follow the money. And I can't blame him for that. I would do the same exact thing. Well, I would respond. <laughs> but other than that, I would, I would do the same thing. So Tech Vets is not a one-man show. It is not just Mike. It is not just Carrie. It's Mike and Carrie. And if Mike's not available or Carrie's not available, then there's not going to be a show until we can both align our schedules to make it so. But as long as the website's up and running and the downloads are available to download, it's operating and it's running. I have Windows 10 1809 wondering when another update is coming. Uh, Windows, Microsoft will update Windows every fall and every spring. So the next update to Windows 10 should be in the spring and then another one in the fall and another one in the spring and another one in the fall and another in the spring and another in the fall and another in the spring and another in the fall and another in the spring and since we just had the update in the fall I guess the answer to your question is What are your opinions on external drives? I find a lot of them, whether they're SSD or HDD, just fail. Well, all drives fail. If, you're, if you want to make copies of your important data, um, the, the reason we make copies is not just for drive failure concerns, but also for virus concerns, theft concerns, fire concerns, flood concerns, accidental deletion. There's a lot of reasons why. And so putting the data on an external drive is not really a proper backup. It's a backup, don't get me wrong. It's not a proper backup. If you want to stop worrying about drive failures, then start putting your stuff up to the cloud. Use Google Drive, Microsoft Drive, Backblaze, something. They have drives fail all the time. You don't know about it because you just pay them the money for it. I think Google Drive, I get two gigs a month for $2.99. Is it two, not two gigs, more than two gigs. What am I saying? 200 gigs. 200 gigs for $2.99 a month. I mean, come on. You know how many months you'd pay for just to pay for one external drive? And those Google data centers, they go through drives like you wouldn't believe, and they just replace them. It's somebody's job. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't even know what's happening. 
So if that's what you're looking for, then you want to go to a service like that. If you're backing up large amounts of data where that's not practical or you don't have enough bandwidth to support that upload um, bandwidth, then what I would do is buy numerous external drives, buy like three of them, and then you rotate them. And as one fails, you replace it. If you get the laptop size drives, those things seem to last forever. But they're not meant to be plugged in and left plugged in. They're meant to be plugged in, copy your data, unplug it, and put it away. That being said, if somebody were to burglarize your home or office, wherever this data is being kept, it's gone. You know, if it's a flood, a fire, whatever causes that burglary, it's gone forever. So the idea, if the data is important, is you get it out of the building, which would mean take it to work, or if you're at work, take it home. So if anything happens at the other place, you've still got it. And that's what Google Drive and Microsoft OneDrive and Backblaze, et cetera, Carbonite, Mosey, that's what they do for you. They get it out of your location and they put it in an entirely different location. That big devastating fire in Paradise, California, I'm sure there's been a lot of data loss. Nobody's, when these things happen, nobody talks about that data loss. The World Trade Center, nobody talks about the amount of data lost. They just don't talk about it. But when you talk to the individuals, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, like you and I are talking, I think you'll find that those on-site backups are absolutely worthless. Um, nobody cares until it happens to them. Until it happens to them, it's never gonna happen to them. And then it happens to them. So if you wanna properly prepare for a worst case scenario, you get the data out of the building. Whether that's with an external drive, manually carried uh, the old sneaker net, <laughs> or just using a, another computer out in the cloud. <clears throat> All right, guys, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, we should have some better luck with broadcasting, I hope, tomorrow and try and do a couple of videos tomorrow, little short videos like Windows 10 install, um, I'll show you some utilities I use, um, maybe some live updates and how they work and how to do them. We'll see as time permits. In the meantime, thanks so much for joining. I appreciate everybody, uh, all my moderators there in blue for keeping everything civil and uh, keeping the, the um, the chat flowing. I'm just looking, somebody wants to know what flash drive I use. I like these SanDisk Extreme Pros. They're SSD speeds. Uh, a 16 gig SSD Pro is $20. They're not cheap. You will spend more money for one, but they're worth it. It's 16 gigs about, is the smallest size you can buy. So I've been buying as many of them as I can because I know that when the 16 gig ones are done, then everything's the smallest is going to be 32 or 64. And I need them to be in FAT32 for like flash drives and things like that. And you can't, I'm trying to think what the rules are, the limits on FAT32. So I spend the 20 bucks on a 16 gig SanDisk Extreme Pro, even though for the same 20 bucks I could buy a 128 gig Samsung Bar flash drive. But it doesn't have the performance I need and I need the size to be smaller. So I spend the 20 bucks. I mean, heck, I've spent more for less in other avenues of life, like buying dinner. And I'll have this a lot longer than I'll have the dinner. But uh, yeah, so anyway, thank you again, everybody, for joining me. Thanks for uh, your patience with all the interruptions we had today. Things didn't go as I had planned, but this is live, and this is what happens when you go live, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on if you like randomness, today was a good example of that. And for all the contributions that came in, let's give another shout out to everybody who contributed. Let's make sure I have shouted out everybody's name. Ben DeCour, Brendan Looney, Gary Kane, Ned Curtis, Christoph Esch, Bill Ottinger, Kevin Lavis, Jeff Stetson, Remus Constantine, Stephen Barber, Billy Zhu, Granddad47, Jack Russell, Ed S., Christoph Esch again, Tim Burchard, Orlando Brieve and Adrian Mangan. Thank you guys so much for your continued support of the channel. And I will hopefully see you all again around, uh, I'm guessing, 1 p.m.-ish, if everything goes well, tomorrow afternoon, Arizona time. Until then. <laughs>